In this live martial arts lesson, you're gonna discover how to train with a bow or a Japanese bow staff, martial arts long staff. Start with the staff in one hand, you're gonna twist it one way and then back the other way to start to get some blood in the wrists and the forearms and the elbow, the shoulder. You wanna keep the joints uh, lubricated, but you also wanna warm up properly to stay safe from injury during this workout. You're twisting for about 30 seconds on one hand, and then you're gonna put it in the other one and start to twist it. Just back and forth, getting warmed up nice and easily from the beginning. You're gonna move faster in a little bit, but always start smart. Get the blood flowing in there. And this is also gonna really strengthen your forearms and your grip. This is gonna help in all your martial arts. I was thinking about it today. If you lose your staff, now you have to know how to do hand-to-hand -hand combat, right? When I was in the military, you carry your weapon, you have a variety of weapons sometimes, depending on what your job is. But in the end of the day, you run out of bullets, you run out of grenades, you need to be able to fix a bayonet, you break your bayonet, you need to be able to go hand-to-hand. -hand. So I was thinking about, how about some hand-to-hand -hand combat training? We might do that one today. Hello, it's good to see you. So now that you've warmed up 30 seconds, start to go from side to side. I know a lot of people who do martial arts weapons also do regular martial arts or traditional martial arts. But if you're not doing that yet, consider it. Start to think about it. Starting with just a simple one-two punch, get out of the way, learn how to do an uppercut, a hook punch, some simple things. It's about timing and distance, speed, power. You need to get some basic footwork and then learn the principles of self-defense. You're going side to side. So you start to learn how to move the staff from one hand to the other one without dropping it on the floor. And if you do drop it during training, just pick it up. If you drop it when you're fighting, you better hit them a couple times and then pick it up for self-defense. But learn how to do both. Don't get yourself in a position where you lose your stick and you don't know what to do. All right, after you've done this from side to side, put it in one hand and I want you to go into a figure eight spin around your body. One foot in front of the other one. Slow as smooth, smooth as fast. Learn this basic technique first. You're doing a circle over here and a circle here. Side to side. Pull your stomach up and in, abs tight. You start to make a quick motion with your shoulders and your hips. It goes faster and then step up so your feet are directly into your body. Put it in front of your body. You're gonna to go to the front and the back. Learn how to do it in both planes. It's good to see you. Welcome. 30 seconds in each plane. The same hand, this is just that forward spin. Put it into the other hand. That foot goes forward. Figure eight, this is my right hand, so right foot forward. It doesn't matter which hand you do first. I'm left-handed, I favor the left. So going on one side and on the other one. Gradually increasing speed. You do that by squeezing your abs tight, making quick motions, small motions in your hips, in your shoulders, and then out to the side, to the front and the back of your body. Twisting quicker, faster. Notice that my hand stays closed. Don't do this. This is a bad habit. You'll see some people will do that. They come back. When they go back, that makes it easier. And you might get some extra speed at the beginning, but then when you run into something, you've lost your staff. And that's when you better know how to right, defend yourself with your hands, your feet maybe. Go a little bit quicker. Not necessarily, um, but it, it, two things. Not necessarily, you might not, if you're hitting, if you're spinning like this, and you hit somebody, you won't necessarily lose your staff, depending on how strong your wrist is, where you hit them in that thing. Number two, you're not going to do a figure eight for self-defense. Self-defense, you're gonna stand here. The weapon is between you and the threat. You're behind the weapon. They come closer, you point your thumb at them. That creates distance. Now they gotta get around this. Then you're gonna hit them like this. That's one strike. Just straight in, you can turn that wrist a little bit, just spearing right through their middle. That's the first, here's the second strike. Here's the third strike, here's the fourth strike. You're not then gonna start spinning your figure eight, 
and then fight with that. That's not the purpose of the figure eight. Jumping rope for a boxer. Think of a boxer, right? The boxer gets in the ring on the night of the fight. The uh, ring girls are there doing the thing, a ring card, but they got the gloves on, the hands are wrapped, and they, they're boxing. Boom, boom, you know, they're fighting, right? But in training, the boxer skips rope, different footwork. In training, the boxer punches the bag. In training, they do the speed bag, but they don't do that in the fight. They're not fighting in the fight. They don't hit a bag. In the fight, they're not doing the speed bag. In the fight, they're not doing jump rope, push-ups, medicine ball crunches. They do that to condition the body so that when they get in the ring, they can fight fast. You spin. All of this spinning, all of the fancy things that you do, on the finger rolls even, all of that doesn't happen in the fight. Self-defense, that's it, right? Block, strike, strike, block, block, clear, spin, twist. That's the self-defense fight, but you don't spin. Spinning is to condition your body. Stronger wrists, more flexible. Stronger hands, more power. Harder strikes, better cardio. If you're a big, let me choose my words. If you're out of shape, you're not gonna be able to last very long. I don't care what your weapon is. And then if you lose your weapon and you have to go to throwing some punches and moving, you're gonna, you're gonna lose simply because you watch too much television or you binge watch some TV. Yes, um, it's all conditioning. Spinning is fun and it's fun cross training. Just like if you're a, a fighter and you go and you box and you learn. First thing you learn in a really good boxing school is footwork, moving up and down, right? Moving forward, moving back, moving forward. Moving, but you can't spend all your time doing that. So then they throw in a bag and then you have different kinds of bags. And then they throw this in, it's all conditioning. When you get in the ring, none of that's there. But everything that you did got you ready for that. So think of spinning from now and forever because everybody uh, gets really confused about it. Why would you do the figure eight? They're gonna hit you and take it away. Or you're gonna drop it. That's not the purpose of the figure eight. The purpose of the figure eight is this, 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 cardio, right? I want you to sweat. I really want you to sweat. I want you to get so physically like a specimen, not like a bodybuilder, but lean and strong and fast. Whatever martial arts style you do, I want you to have that fighting fitness, and that comes from all this cross training. All right, so you're in this figure eight. We did the front of the body, we did the side and the back, put it back into the first hand and reverse the figure eight. Now pulling with the pinky side, the small side of your hand, side to side. It also teaches spatial awareness. I mentioned that because I just whacked myself on the, uh, the elbow there. That's good, it's good feedback. I'd rather learn it here than if I need to defend myself, learn it the hard way. Go to the front, go to the back, increasing your speed. And here's a progression, a progression that just like a level up. You've been doing this for a while, you wanna get better at it. When you do these figure eights, whether it's forward or backward, do them low, do them in the middle of your body, do them above your head. Same thing to the side, do it down here, and you're gonna feel the different parts of your forearm and your uh, shoulder are going to be engaged. That means, engaged means you're gonna build muscle, speed, strength, because you vary in your training. And here's what happens in all kinds of fitness training, martial arts training is included. You hit a plateau. That pla not the same as being bored. You're bored is because you're doing it in a boring way. Don't be boring, right? Turn up your intensity and your focus. Intensity and focus. Work harder and concentrate more. That's how you beat boredom. But what I'm talking about is plateau, where you don't see any more progress. That's when you have to have some variation. Bodybuilders call it uh, muscle confusion. You're gonna confuse your muscles because you've been doing this really well for a long time, but do it up here now. And then travel down and up. Keep the stomach tight, down and up. 
and you'll see it's gonna hit your body in a different way, and then you're gonna break through the plateau and go to the next peak. You wanna keep climbing mountains. You get to the top of the mountain, you look out, you see one that's taller, you go for the next one. You don't wanna get stuck. Because as soon as you stop growing, you start dying. That's true in life, that's true in martial arts. Dying means you start getting, I almost said it again, out of shape. I was gonna say fat and lazy. I'm just gonna say it. You start getting fat and lazy. And I only think of that because I think about martial arts schools I visited. And not to be mean to anybody, but if you're gonna be a martial artist, you're gonna wear the belt, and you're gonna teach other people, stay in shape. I don't care how old you are and what your injuries are, but I know this for a fact, I'm gonna tell you guys. Some martial artists that I've met were an amazing specimen. Fighting, they were great fighters. They were great uh, form performers, whatever they did, right? Whatever their style is. When they were 18 to 24, maybe 26, and then they, they hit that plateau. They stopped growing, they stopped learning, stopped challenging themselves. And it's just like uh, water that stops moving. Everything in it dies and it attracts mosquitoes and stench, stink. So they start to really stink. But they feel stuck and now they're 42 or 49 or 52 and their gut's out to here and they're still teaching martial arts. And they know the lie is in their head. And I'm not calling them, well, I am calling you out. <laughs> if you happen to see that this is you, you're, I'm calling you out, yeah. I'm, but I'm calling me out too. And when I talk to you, I'm talking to myself more than, you know, more than anything else. If I say you gotta work hard, you gotta intensify if you're bored, it's because you're boring, I'm talking to myself too. It's true for me. All right, so we talked about variation, right? Go up, go down, go up, go down. Then I want you to go into an overhand spin. Down there a little bit. I'm wearing my all white today because the others stink so much I gotta wash them. I keep forgetting to take them and wash them. Can't stand the stink anymore. Gotta wear the all whites. Feel like the traditional karate. You know, uh, who's that, Jesse Encamp? Anybody watch that guy? Um, I, I think because of his accent, he sounds like maybe he's not a tough dude. I don't know what it is. But that guy, I've watched him. That guy, he has spent hours and hours. I think he grew up in a martial arts school. That guy has paid his dues. I watch him and I learn stuff. Yeah, the karate nerd. He deserves every bit of his um, accolades. That guy is not only a great martial artist. He is. I mean, he, I think he's, I'm sure he's younger than me. But he's a great martial artist, but he also seems like a great dude. But more importantly, or most importantly, here, he seems like he really knows what he's talking about. And uh, maybe when he doesn't, let's go the other way. Maybe he's the first to say, I don't know what I'm talking about. I don't know about that. I don't watch anybody enough to know that. I watch that Icy Mike. Anybody watch Icy Mike, the hard to hurt dude? He's interesting. He's more, everybody's more complex than they seem on social media. It's obvious. And, and if, there's a, if there's somebody who's adding value to the conversation, they're teaching stuff, that's, you know, that's valuable to me. That's what I like. Just not, I don't like the guys who just get on there and tear other people up or point out where everybody else is wrong. I like it when they create value. All right, so now you have those. I want to go back to the strikes just a little bit. The principles of self-defense, using this for self-defense. Yeah, uh, you can. Um, when, I, when I'm doing this uh, stuff for you guys, I'm usually up here because of where the camera is, and I try not to lift it up and down because I don't have a camera person. It's just me and a tripod. But yes, ideally, your shoulders won't go up and down. You'll keep the shoulders level when my shoulders go up, up and down two things are happening either i'm tired <laughs> and it's just bad form right and i've got bad form you've got bad form my form's off I'm not thinking about it not con or whatever or i'm up here and i'm trying to get my hands in so you can see exactly what i'm doing but that's a great question excellent question 
Thank you. Ask me those questions. All right, back to self-defense, because I really, truly, fundamentally want you to understand that martial arts is about fighting. Martial arts, yes, it can help little kids with grades and be respectful to mommy. Uh, yes, it's good for self-defense. Yes, it's good for discipline for young men and young women to get their mind right. But mostly, it's, it's fighting, whether it's grappling on the ground, throwing with judo, uh, striking, Muay Thai, right? Or boxing, Western wrestling, whatever it is. It's fighting. It's, um, it's either fighting competitively as a sport, or if we're talking about self-defense, it shifts and it becomes violence. And it's coordinated violence for the purpose of staying safe and getting out of there alive and letting the other person go home in a body bag, whatever it is, for self-defense but it's fighting. The same thing is true with this. This is a weapon. We call it a weapon because, and you know what a weapon means. It's a weapon like any other weapon. The purpose of the weapon is to hurt somebody. It's to either um, stop them from hurting you or take their life. I mean, that's, why else would you have a gun, right? And I'm not talking politics or Second Amendment or anything like that. I'm just talking about practicality. So if you understand this is a weapon, you have to know not just techniques. These are all techniques. Strikes, you have strikes with the hands like this. You have this kind of striking. You have the strikes with the hands in uh, opposing each other in this position. These are all strikes. You have twisting strikes. You have blocks. You have blocks. You have clearing. Clear, you have all these cool blocks and all the things that you do. But, and those are techniques. I don't want you to get stuck on techniques. That's why this curriculum, if you look at the curriculum, it's all about learning how to do everything you can with this. And then when it comes to self-defense, learning principles. Principles of self-defense always start with situational awareness. So we'll talk about that with the staff. You're walking outside, you're walking, for whatever reason. Let's just say you're going for a walk with your staff because you heard there's a dog on the loose in the neighborhood. Or maybe you've been bit. There are two guys now in my neighborhood who walk with a stick. One is about this long, the other stick is, is longer. One looks like a hanbo, if you know what that is, or a hanbo, the short stick, and then one looks like a joe, which is about this high. And both of them, I've talked to them now, they walk because they've been bit by a dog in the neighborhood, and they're not gonna get bit again. So maybe that's you, whatever your reason is. The first principle is pay attention to what's happening around you while it's happening, situational awareness. Number two, create distance between you and the threat. And you're gonna do that simply by pointing your thumb at the threat. Uh, which strike? We'll, we'll, go over, we'll go over the strikes in more detail. Awesome, yeah. I love Kung Fu, I love the rope dart. So from here, point your thumb. Now, you can just go straight in. You can turn your hand, you can push it through the other one. Those are all valid strikes. You don't necessarily have to turn. I have the habit of this turn because when I hit, this is gonna absorb the impact from hitting the other person. Person coming at me, I hit, and if I turn it over, I get what's called a tendon lock. In martial arts, there are all these turns and techniques. The purpose of the turn is to deflect the energy that's coming from your attack through my hand, through the joints, into the floor, so I don't break my Awesome, I love that. Yeah, we'll make some more of those. I've been itching to do lightsaber videos. But so you don't break your, uh, good morning, break your, um, your bones. If you just, if this sticks coming down at my head or into my face this way, and I just hit it like this, and it hurts just doing that, right? That kind of hurts. If I twist, see how that knocks it away? And that also circles or spirals the energy through the bone or the, the impact. If I just comes straight in, it can break very easily. If I twist, I'm not gonna break my arm. Same is true for my staff. When you turn, and for the uh, Japanese sword, for like the katana, even though that's a very flexible blade, because of the way they're made, it's that folded metal, there's always a twist, a turn. And, and uh, think of Kali sticks or a screma, arnis. All the strikes are slicing motions, slicing, and it's the same thing, that arc keeps it from breaking. This is a chopping motion. You just come straight down and you're gonna, uh, yeah, exact, same principle as in a lot of martial arts. That's why I think there are more sim similarities than there are differences. 
for the most part. But if you come straight down, it just breaks, right? Whether it's your collie stick, if it's a blade. I had my, um, I had, I was, do, I was doing an earlier video on hand-to-hand -hand combat and I had my, uh, but the thing that goes on the end of this, the, th the I can't, I don't know why I can't think of it. Um, <laughs> my knife that goes on the end of my rifle. Anyway, it, that thing is super flexible and strong. But if you bring that down and you just hit it against something, and I've done this so many times because I used to throw knives all the time. Bayonet, thank you. <laughs> I had my bayonet from the Marine Corps from years ago. I kept it. But if it comes straight down, it breaks the blade. But if you slice, it doesn't break the blade. So when you're using any kind of weapon in martial arts, there's always either a spiraling motion or an arcing motion in everything. There's never a baseball bat. Boom! Well, there, there are a couple moves where you can slide in, but it starts here, pushing, and so you have, and the push creates both a twist, which is the spiral, and the, um, the arc, the arc coming down. So situational awareness, first principle self-defense of the weapon. Number two, create distance between you and the threat by simply pointing your thumb. Now this does two things. One, it puts the, the rest of the length of the stick between the guy I don't want to touch me and me. And I, I teach this all the time. Like when people do their martial arts, right? Traditional, traditional martial arts. They block up and they stop like this. Two things happen. One, you can see the top of my head, you're gonna smash it. Three things. Two, you're gonna break my arm because my arm's in the wrong position and it's gonna just collapse. But three, you're really close. Do I wanna block you here? Or do I wanna block you way out there? Same thing, like uh, any kind of block. Do I wanna block you like uh, flinch block? This is the best for self-defense, by the way. Flinch block from here. Do I want you to be this far, this far away from me, out here? Or do I want you to be in close? And a lot of people, because of the way our brains work, they're in like this. Now that's different from like boxing. You know, like a, a good boxers, boxers know how to move their body and how to turn and how to come in and how to come out and how to keep their head moving with their body. And you're gonna learn that when you do boxing. But when we're talking street self-defense, I wanna teach you the fastest way possible. I'm gonna teach you like this, flinch block. And that's gonna put them all the way out here. And you'd rather have the person who wants to hurt you way out here than in your face. It's obvious, right? So the same is true with this. Now you've created that distance. The only thing left is to ask yourself, take a breath first. That centers you, brings a little bit of oxygen in your brain. So you stop seeing stars, you calm down. And you ask yourself, what are my targets? His eyeballs, his nose, his teeth, his throat, his solar plexus, the, um, between the belly button and the privates, the thin muscle there that that rips, that fascia, he gets a hernia, or she, if she's a bad girl or whatever. And then the privates, the knees. If I take out his knees, he can't chase after me, he can't grab me, can't kick me, can't punch me. If I take out his eyesight, he can't see me. If I take out his ability to breathe, if I take out his ability to, uh, you know, his teeth, to whatever, you're gonna remove the targets with your stick. And that, those are basic principles, right? One, and then strike. Yeah, feet. Oh, we were doing this yesterday. Is that you? Oh, no. Um, this, uh, I'm working with Mike. Mike loves to uh, practice what happens. The guy pulls out the knife. So we do the knife scenario for a good 20 minutes all the time. And Mike's tired, and Mike's getting close. And, and what happens is I have this knife, right? Where is that knife? Hold on, I'll show you. It's a trainer, right? So I got this trainer knife and I'm coming at him and I go a little slow at the beginning and then we speed it up. And I, you know, I, I try to bring it in. His goal, he needs to get it against my body and then go through, yeah. he keeps saying that. And he, and he um, as soon as his eyes go to my knife, he's done. Cause he's now thinking about my knife. And I, and I can take that, as soon as your eyes go to my knife, then I, I, I've got it in you all over the place, right? So, but if, when he keeps his eyes on mine and he thinks about principles, situation awareness, number one, always. Number two, get in that position, right? As soon as he sees the threat, he's, he's in his flinch block. He's ready. Three, he sees the knife come out. His goal is to 
attach it to my body so I can't get it out. This is hard for me to lift this way than it is if it's already out, right? But to get it in there, and then his elbow is coming to my throat. It's coming to my nose, it's coming to my teeth. And we train, we try to train a little bit rougher and rougher and rougher so that he gets more of a realistic experience. And it's not just this candy, you know, fake martial arts, uh, this is what we're gonna do. Because he's gonna get sliced, he's gonna get cut by it. And in his profession, he's thinking this might really happen. So please don't go easy and don't make it easy for me. When he gets tired though, we all do this. He starts looking at the knife. As soon as he looks at the knife, he's broken that, set, uh, that principle. The principle is, what are my targets that he destroys? These are your principles for, for the bow staff. What are the targets that you have to destroy with the stick? If you're focused on that, then you're in control of the fight. You're in control of what's happening. As soon as you think about, oh my gosh, he's got a knife, and you start looking at that knife, he's in control because your mind went to his knife and you're no longer thinking about targets. And I know that seems like a, a oversimplification, but that, that one thing is all the difference because as soon as his mind shifts to what are his targets and he's going for my nose and his elbows coming at my throat and when it, it hurts, I don't know if you've done more realistic training, it hurts, right? So my hand naturally wants to come up here. As soon as my hand comes up here, I'm not thinking about my knife anymore. He just took control. You're going to take control. If you stay in line with these principles, situation awareness always number one. I'll say that until I die. Number two, get in a better position. Get behind your weapon. Three, in the case of this staff, point your thumb at the target. That puts it into your back hand, just naturally, from here to here. Here. Now you have two hands on the staff. It's better than one hand on the staff. And then a deep breath because you need to center. You need to learn how to calm down and not slow down. Everybody wants to slow down. Slow down and try to understand. Well, what did you say? What was the proper angle? Is it 42 degrees or 57? And they start focusing on the wrong things. You can't afford to slow down. You got to be able to just go. But it comes back to that concept of the target and then how are you going to destroy it? And the targets are always going to be different. But the dog, different targets. You said the foot, but this, uh, this is where I, how I started. So Mike, he's getting tired, and I'm controlling both of his hands. He's not going to headbutt me. He can't do any of these things. But, it's, but I said, you know, your foot's right there. Stop on my foot. As soon as he stops on my foot, ouch, right? He stops on my foot. My mind goes to my foot, no longer on the knife. Then his hands are free. He's coming back up with the elbows. So focus on those principles and stop thinking about technique. Technique doesn't matter. Principles, techniques will get you killed. This is the saying in, uh, in real-world self-defense. Techniques get you killed. Principles will save your life. What is the principle? What are his targets? And then destroy him. Stay focused on his targets. Just go through his targets. All right. I know. Um, I think he's, he's messing with this all. But the whole thing is going to cut through my uh, staff, Right? Oh, what's that, what's that TV show? Um, has the, uh, one of the great, uh, 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 what is his name? Mercada, Doug Mercada. And uh, Ronan, the um, Special Forces um, the Asian guy. Uh, I think he's maybe Vietnamese descent. Anybody know what I'm talking about? He's got a channel called Ronan. He, he loves the st stick fighting, knife fighting. And they do um, like Fortune and Steel or something, right? And thank you. Anyway, and they, they do things where they build blades and they try to cut through stuff all the time. But if you watch how they're, what they're cutting through, they're not cutting through three layers of oak. And yes, if I give you enough time, you can slice through my staff. Uh, but it might take two, three, three to three or four minutes with a serrated blade. I'm not going to stand there like that. Go ahead, cut it, cut it, cut it. Bam, I'm going to smash in the face, right? And... If that knife's in your hand and you come out, I'm going for the knife or I'm going for your targets. I'm gonna take your targets out of your face and you're gonna to have to deal with, like you said, Vic, you're gonna to have to deal with the length of my staff. This is one of my favorite strikes, by the way. Pushing through and pushing through. If you haven't practiced that, practice here, get behind your target or behind your weapon, point your thumb at the target and then push. Imagine the threat behind you Strike, always look at the threat, right? Strike, practice one, two, one, two. This is on that next level, that second level. We're going through here, we're going through here. One and two, but I wanna get back to spins. Let's go into the wrist roll. 
on the wrist roll as it comes up. Now, this is my left hand, so I'm going to turn it away from me. I'm going to open the hand and let it roll over the back of the hand. Back of the hand. Yeah. Back of the hand. Singe man. When I, was, I called you out the other day, I'm like, you talking about the knife? I was wrong. It's the sounds of terraria. Is that from a book or something? Nice. Easy. You got this, Vic. Easy. So practice here to here, and then go on the other hand and back. And I want you to do it this way. So you're going over one side and the other way, and then just put it in the other hand and do the same thing. Over the pinky side, and then come over the thumb side. Because eventually, I want you to move up to stopping it and pushing it, right? So you're gonna push it and push it. Push it and push it. You're gonna come here and here. So from one side to the other side. Speaking of pushing, I think you're practicing the art of pushing buttons, which is fine. You know, we all did, you did it. That just makes me think you might be um, in the teen range, which is fine. Welcome if you're a teenager or a tween, maybe you're a tween. Anyway, if you're older than that, it's time to grow up. If you're older than that, it's time to grow up. You, you know what I'm saying? It's crazy right now. It's like our world is being controlled by outside forces. And they're trying to divide us and conquer us. And we're like, person to person, you and I have so much in common. I don't care who you are. But if you spend too much time on social media or reading news websites, they'll give you all the talking points why we're so different. And it's just BS. Good. One of the best ways to digest your breakfast is go for a brisk walk. You start walking briskly. Um, the way you're doing elbows in, more control, and it's the correct way to do it. And again, um, I, I, a lot of times because of the structure of the video, the camera's up here. It's higher than I would. I would normally do it down here, and I would keep the elbows in, right? But I'm up here, and so, so you're absolutely right. What you're seeing is my elbows are coming out because I'm doing it for the camera. I'm going to lower it just a little bit, make it a little bit easier. But as you're practicing, you do want to try to keep your elbows in. Oh, just dropped it. And you also want to start going faster and faster. And then when you go faster, if your elbows come out a little bit, don't worry about it too much. Because eventually, you want to be able to fight, right? And if your elbows come out a little bit, that's okay. to give you that mobility. But you're right. When you practice it, try to control those elbows. And then the other thing I want you to see is this. When you're coming around, try to keep your hands in contact either with your other hand or the staff the whole time. So as you're coming around, see how that kind of slides past the hand to get back on the staff instead of this. So that's a progression. That's a level up. As you start to get better, you get it closer and closer. And then you want to go faster and faster. And don't go for perfection. Don't go for perfection. This is so, so, so important. Everybody goes for, uh, yes, everybody goes for uh, perfection. But instead of perfection, I'm going to lift it back up. Hold on. I'll crank it to try to make it less. Uh... Yeah. Uh, perfection kills us all. It's a guilt. Two things you never want in your life. You don't want guilt. You don't want to make decisions out of guilt, especially if you're a parent. Uh, parents and teachers do it all the time. They feel guilty. They let kids get away with stuff. Kids need structure, right? Number two. Yes and no, you don't necessarily have to go for the knife right away. Let's say you're the assassin. Now you gotta get around my stick. If I start worrying about your knife here, you know, I might go like this, you might sidestep it and stick it in me. If I stick it in your face, you've gotta get around my stick. If I smash, 
smash you on the head and break your skull, or at least knock you down a little bit, then at the end, I can find the hand that has the knife, and if it's still in the hand, I can clear it and knock it out of the hand. So yes and no, get it, it goes back to what are the targets. If, 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 you, if you're an assassin and you know what you're doing with that knife, and you, you want my eyes to go to your knife, and that me looking away down at the knife changes my ability to judge distance in the back of my head subconsciously, you can close that distance, I'm dead. But if I'm here and I'm focused on your eyes, and you've got that knife, and you're trying to get around my stick, and, and, I, hit, and I make short, quick, explosive, powerful strikes to smash you, then it would be hard. I like it. Keep, keep saying whatever you want to say. What I think you should do is go after his face, if that's the target, or hit the body. Remember the principle, keep the distance. If you can keep that stick between you and the guy with the knife, that you want all that distance as much as you can, right? Short, quick, fast, explosive things. And then there'll be a time to go for the knife. All right, let's talk about, um, that's why I lifted the butterfly. Two ways to do the butterfly. This is an overhand butterfly spin. So this is my left hand. It turns all the way up. This is here. The right hand is over the top. And then you're gonna see, see how it comes into my thumb? And that's what makes that butterfly motion. So I turn, this goes down, palm away from you. This is my left arm again. The right hand, palm away from the left, facing the left. I turn, I grab it, I keep turning. Second way to do it. No. <laughs> um, hold on, I'm just kind of half joking. Just had to check something real quick. No, I'm not a people pleaser. You can ask anybody in my life and they'll tell you. You know what, he's a lot of things, but he's not a people pleaser. Uh, but yes, I have worked with a lot, a lot, a lot of people pleasers on how to fix that or change it, right? I'll say one thing first. There's a lot going against you. If you're a people pleaser, uh, women are just naturally, like, like boys are naturally designed, like, uh, what's the word? Instinctively. They, especially in school, you'll see it all the time, the, the little kids. They want to make each other laugh. Everything's about getting attention from each other and making each other laugh and getting all their social power comes from their interaction with each other, the boys. Girls are like this to the teacher. Girls are all about pleasing the teacher, listening, having the right answer for the most part. And then there are exceptions on both sides. Um, boys, because every teacher in elementary school across the United States, especially and around the world, usually are moms or women. Most little boys now, for the last 30 years, especially here, have been beaten down from acting like boys. And then they use these things, they say, make a good choice, what do you think we should be doing? What do you think you should be doing? Make a good choice. And then they say, friends, friends, we're all friends here. So society has made you a people pleaser. And um, let's do the, so, so quickly, sorry. Overhand, butterfly spin. And the, uh, uh, deliver. And then underhand, um, same hand, so this left hand, the, the hand's gonna be under it. This is the right hand. So this is over, the right hand's over. Under, I'm gonna take it and I'm gonna place it into the left hand. My wrists will not separate. My right hand's gonna turn down to turn up. And again, I'm, I've lifted my hands to get a good camera shot for you to see. You can do it down here a little bit easier. And you'll see some people do it like this and their elbows are really cranking up and that's to get speed. And they do that to get speed. But if you can do this, keeping your elbows down and your wrists together, you're gonna get a lot more control and you'll get yeah, <laughs> I had my K bar. My K bar is in the back of the truck. It's in my um, breakout bag or bug out bag, whatever you get home bag. I've got, uh, you know, I've got the light. I've got the food. I've got all the things in case stuff hits the fan. 
but that's where my K-bar is. I've got two K-bars. I don't know where the other one is. I still have all the scars. The day I bought my K-bar from the PX in the Marine Corps, pulled it out, sliced, it was so sharp. Sliced the, uh, the leather scabbard and then sliced off a big chunk of my thumb. Playing around, don't play with knives. Or at least if you do, learn your lessons quite quickly. Don't make the same mistakes over and over again. That was a good lesson. All right, so that's a butter, butterfly spin. Anyway, society's conditioned you to be a people pleaser. If you, if the first thing you have to do is you have to make a mantra. Daily mantra is when you say things to yourself. Because sometimes the only nice thing people say to you is what you say about yourself. And that's not a cliche. That's the truth. So you wake up in the morning. First thing you do is make a gratitude list. Thank you for waking me up today. I'm so happy and excited that I can breathe. I'm so glad that I can see or hear or feel the wind or or whatever it is. I'm grateful for, that I get to spend some time with my family today and see my kids grow. Make a gratitude list so that you start your mind right and you're not moaning and groaning. <laughs> I almost said bad words again. You're not whining all the time and you're not playing the perpetual victim. Don't be a victim. But if you wanna get rid of this people pleasing, start with that. Gratitude for what you have. That then shifts your mind to who you are as a person and say this, no one has to approve the goals and dreams I have for myself. And if you have a family, no one has to approve the goals and dreams I have for my family. And, and start that mantra. And remind yourself during the day, no one else has to approve the goals and dreams I have for my family. And you have to, you have to start real small, especially if it's been beaten into you over time or if it's in your nature to be a people pleaser and only do things to make other people happy. You have to start with that mantra. But start with gratitude for what you have because that shifts your focus back onto yourself in your life. And that's where you have to live your life, present in the moment in your life, not on what other people have or not what other people expect you to have. Yeah, it's all the same. We've all been saying the same stuff. Not that I'm Marcus Aurelius, but we've all been saying the same stuff for a million years. Um, I heard someone say that really cool the other day. Maybe it was Elon Musk or somebody. No, probably not. But something about um, how there are no original thoughts. There's, there's like universal knowledge and we all have access to it but you have to center and pull yourself in. And that's to your point. If you're worried about what mom or dad or your sister or the people down the street or the people you work with think about you and think about what you should be doing and how you should be living your life, if that's your focus, that leads to resentment, frustration, all kinds of negative emotions for you, and then you can't focus on yourself. You can't focus on the, the next step. So bring it all back in. Start with gratitude. Number two, that's your mantra. I'll give you the rest later. I gotta go get the package before. I'm not in the best neighborhood. Somebody might take it, but I'll go get the package. Um, but number one is gratitude. Start the day in gratitude. Make a list. Write it down. Write it down. And don't just say um, uh, eyesight, breathing, family, friends, money, whatever it is. Say, uh, pick two or three things. That's it. That's all you have to do. I'm so glad that I was uh, given another chance today to live my life and, 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 and feel pain and suffering, but also excitement and energy, if that's your, what your gratitude for. I'm so grateful that I have friends and family who support me and love me, or I'm so grateful that um, even though everything else is shit in my life, I get an opportunity to try to be a better person today, whatever it is, but to write that, bring the focus back in. Number two, write it out, make it a mantra. No one has to approve the goals and dreams for myself. If you have a family, no one has to approve the goals and dreams I have for myself and my family, including your family. You might have goals and dreams for your spouse or your kids that they don't necessarily agree with. That doesn't mean be obtuse and uh, abusive and push them away. That just means don't let anybody tell you no. Don't let anybody tell you that you can't do that. <laughs> I think I told you one time there were, uh, the guy was strong arming the liquor store next, do next door and I was dressed like this and I came out and I saw the guy walking. He had two, uh, two handles of Captain Morgan, one in each hand. And his pants kept falling down. He kept trying to pull his pants up. And real tall man, older guy. There's a lot of homeless that live in the park right next door. And the, the owner, and I wasn't sure. I'm, I'm like, I'm thinking that guy just stole that. The owner comes running out. And he's got his face mask on because of the Wuhan. And he's screaming at the guy, hey, hey, hey. And the guy starts going faster and faster, trying to get away. And I'm standing there. Right in front of the doors. And I was thinking, I'm gonna run across the street and flying sidekick this guy in the head. And then my YouTube channel is gonna take off. I really had that thought. But my kids were inside. 
And I thought, I'm not gonna leave my kids to go get the guy. He just stole a couple things of liquor or whatever. So I chose not to. That's why you didn't hear about me on the news. This was right at the beginning of the whole shutdown. So it would have been, you know, would have been awesome. Anyway, um, the, you know, somebody wants stuff that I have. Oh, I found out today the person that stole my wallet two years ago uh, just plea bargained and part of their settlement is she's paying me back all the cash she took. I saved all these $2 bills to give to my kids when they lose their teeth. From when my mom gave me a baby book and it had a $2 bill in it, I thought, oh, I'm gonna save that and give that to my, that was all in my wallet when they, this uh, uh, fentanyl addict and her boyfriend stole you know, wallets and stuff. And I left my wallet in my car with the door unlocked. And you know what the first thought was? That's my fault. I shouldn't have left my wallet in the car. That doesn't excuse her. And when the, the prosecutor called and said, hey, can we make her this plea? Because I get a joy, uh, uh, say, I guess. You know, can we, um, we want to make this plea bargain. Do you want to ask for restitution? And I said, yes, you should pay. Because if you don't have any skin in the game or you don't pay for the mistakes you made, I think you keep making them. Anyway, that has nothing to do with anything, but I'll see you guys later. Thanks so much for watching and catch me on the next one.